I've done many embeds in my 16 years as a war correspondent with the US military and other militaries around the world. But this time I'm embedding with the Free Burma Rangers, a humanitarian aid organization run by Dave Eubank that takes medical teams into the hot zones and helps people in need. This is the hot zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Okay, so this is Syria day three. We are just outside the city of Hasaka, uh, which is kind of centrally located in the eastern part of Syria, what they call Rojava this area uh, that is, has been controlled now for several years by the Syrian Democratic Forces or the Kurds. Uh, we stayed the night at a really surreal place. It was, uh, it's hard to describe. Uh, it, it was a straight up safe house is what it was. Uh, it was, I guess, built specifically to, to be a safe house, uh, but Without going into too much detail, the place looked like a casino uh, and had a, a zoo. I mean, the guy had deer and monkeys and peacocks and all sorts of stuff. Uh, swimming pool, uh, just a waterfall. I mean, <laughs> uh, weird, just weird to be in the middle of the uh, Syrian desert and to come upon a place like this late at night, walk in. They've got a huge, looks like Thanksgiving dinner. Look at those kids. Oh, man. They got Thanksgiving dinner almost laid on for us. Incredible feast. And so we gorged ourselves at 11 o'clock at night and before we went to bed, realized that uh, this place actually had sit down toilets. And if you've never used a squatty potty, you don't have any idea what a big deal that is. Uh, I think they're probably the only sit down toilets for 300 miles in any direction. Uh, the squatty potties uh, are, are not a lot of fun for an American because we're not uh, accustomed to being that flexible. And so uh, it's a massive leg workout uh, if you have to uh, use the restroom. But uh, anyway, we had a, a good night. We all packed in like sardines in a couple of rooms on mattresses and we were so tired it didn't even matter didn't even care uh got a quick night's sleep a few hours and got up and had devotions and uh, now we're back on the road again the plan is to go to some of the sites that are uh, being frequented by these internally displaced people who've been driven out of their villages by the fighting. They say that in Hasaka alone, uh, a town of about a half million people, there are something like 160,000 refugees right now, internally displaced people. And that's putting a real big crimp on the food supply here, even the water supply. These, they, they've closed the schools because these people are all staying at the schools. That They're opening the schools as uh, refugee centers. So this, the schools don't, you know, the kids can't go to school. The schools don't have electricity or water either. So there's a massive sanitation issue there. Uh, they need mattresses, they need blankets, uh, they need medical supplies. All of that stuff normally came from Turkey to this area. And now that the border is closed because of the fighting, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the supply anymore uh, coming in from there. And so the, they're, they're telling us last night that uh, this, could, this place could very well run out of those essentials uh, within the next few days. And as a matter of fact, a generous donation from FBR and some of our partners has essentially been feeding these refugees for the last several days, uh, or else they wouldn't have been fed at all. 
Uh, he also told us that, you know, the northern part of Hasaka was the part that had the kind of the industrial sector, the uh, warehouses and things like that. And those things are now under the control of the Turks or maybe the Syrians, I forget. But suffice it to say that uh, all of the supplies for the city are are basically gone and the water has been shut off uh, for most of the time for the city. Uh, and so it's not a good situation here. It's really getting critical. Uh, it, uh, hang on. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm in a convoy right now and I'm trying to keep up. I'm the last one in the convoy, so I'm trying to keep up with the rest of our vehicles. Uh, of course, there's really no such thing as traffic laws here at the moment. And we are in essentially what is a failed state at this point. Although the Kurds did a pretty good job of administering this area uh, and, and are doing a pretty good job to this point uh, as best they can. But um, when you talk about small and limited government, I don't think anybody expect, uh, wanted it to be this quite this small. And now you've got everybody coming for this area. Everybody wants this area from the Iranians. The IRGC has troops uh, in Syria now. Hezbollah from Lebanon, they have troops here. The Russians have troops here. The Turks have troops here. Assad's forces, the Syrian army, uh, are here. And of course, the various factions of the uh, SDF, the, the, uh, which is the YPG, the YPJ, the female version of the YPG, and uh, even some, I guess, some elements of the PKK and others. Uh, so there's a whole lot of people fighting over this area. The people, the civilians, at least here in Hasaka, kind of seem unconcerned at least I mean I'm looking here as we're driving and there's just people kind of walking around going about their business there's a guy with a laptop case uh, probably I don't know walking to school or something uh, there's people on motorcycles I saw three or four people on one motorcycle a whole family going somewhere uh, yesterday I saw a couple of women out for a walk pushing baby carriages uh, and it may be that they're just so used to the, the the chaos here that it doesn't really phase them so much anymore. That's common in war zones. I see that in a lot of places. And I mean, in reality, life has to go on. I mean, you can't just because there's a war on, people don't stop eating. People don't stop trying to make a buck. People don't stop having babies. Uh, so much so uh, you know the, the civilian populace has got to try to make make it work as best they can uh, but things are definitely bad here at the moment and uh, we are so small in the greater scheme of things that while we can provide as best we can for the people we meet the need is so much greater and it's really a, you know, and it, it would take a nation state like the United States to, to really help alleviate the suffering. But I listened to the president give us, he was meeting with the Italian ambassador, uh, I guess yesterday, and we heard him giving a speech uh, when somebody asked him about the uh, situation over here. And he actually spoke very candidly. I was, I was amazed that he really gave a fairly clear explanation of his thought process in ordering with the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria. And while I don't agree with some of what he said, he keeps saying that the United States defeated ISIS the United States did not defeat ISIS. The Kurds defeated ISIS. The United States stood by and watched and provided some air, air cover and that sort of thing. But it wasn't the United States that defeated ISIS. And indeed, if the US had not been here at all, 
the Kurds would have likely taken more casualties, but they probably still would have gotten the job done with or without us. Uh, and so yeah, I, I hate it that he keeps saying that. I, I get why he does it. He's trying to sell to the American people that, hey, we it's that old mission accomplished thing uh, that got George Bush in so much trouble at the beginning of the Iraq war. Uh, there are still very strong, valid reasons for the United States to stay involved in this area. And I applaud the Trump administration for their efforts in the last several days to maybe walk back what the president has has done. Uh, but man, I wish somebody would take his Twitter account away. Uh, you know, it's like, I get it. Visionary people like, like Donald Trump tend to be, I, I'm, I'm kind of like this myself, you know, ready, fire, aim. Um, but man, when you're the leader of the free world, you just cannot spout off without considering the, the ramifications of what you say, or you get what you have here in, in Syria right now, and that is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people suffering because of a flippant comment uh, by the president. And um, so I think that's the, I think that is the, uh, the, the lesson for today. So. Okay, I'm, we're driving through the town of Taltamer. It's, uh, it was bombed a couple nights ago. Uh, there's a lot of checkpoints, a lot of uh, soldiers and guys that were driving through here checking us, checking on us. But uh, it appears to be held by the SDF, the Kurds. We're going to stop up here and have a meeting with somebody. Uh, and hopefully go up and take a look at what would be the current front line. It's amazing because, man, there's kids walking around and just like life is going on. Uh, there's two ladies here walking by. One of them has an AK-47. So I guess that's something you don't see every day. But shoot, bottom line, it's just amazing how people just sort of go on with their lives uh, even in the midst of such a brutal crisis. This hospital behind me is the closest casualty collection point to the front lines right now even though it's almost 25 miles that direction. But although they've treated over 650 patients there's only one patient in the hospital at this moment and that's because they can no longer get anybody out of the affected area because it's been surrounded by Turkish forces and Turkey is deliberately bombing any ambulances that they send on the road going up to the affected area. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.